since we submitted this call for papers, uh, Denim Group got acquired by Coal Fire. So I'm now a vice president at Coal Fire along with uh, Dan Cornell, if you heard him early in the day. So Dan and I were the two, two of the principals that came over as part of that acquisition. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I'm proud to say that uh, Dan and I were, I think, at the first real big OWASP meeting in New York, I want to say 2005-ish with Mark Curfee and Jeff Williams and all those. So we've been... I mean, serial volunteers for OWASP for a decade plus and friends with people all over the world, including OWASP folks. So we'll get started here, if you don't mind, I'll jump in. And oh, great, thank you. Uh, so, so interesting story here is uh, probably about a month or two into the pandemic last year, uh, we're trying to find interesting things to do. We just rolled off of RSA, which was pretty shaky and you know, the pandemic became real. I think uh, Black Hat had just been canceled. We really didn't know about the future. And we were kind of trying to come up with a cool idea uh, that would be fun for research. And the topic of AppSec champions came up. And what ended up being happening was about a nine month to a year journey to create a, a huge survey and survey a series of companies and organizations that were doing AppSec champions particularly well. And what we recognized was Although there have been a lot of programs out there, a lot of speaking at OWASP events, nobody had ever really quantified uh, certain common attributes or, or emerging practices or even best practices. Uh, that there was, it was largely, uh, you know, there's a little bit here and there, but this was an effort to quantify uh, that across some of the major uh, companies that we know. And so we started this really in earnest in April, May of last year. It took the better part of last year. We finished it this spring, and then Coal Fire asked to uh, to to delay this uh, because they wanted to publish it and make a big deal out of it, which they're doing next month. So you are all getting the first glimpse of these numbers as part of this AppSec Champion survey and the results and kind of recommendations out of it. So there's numbers associated with this, but some some certain cool things that you will come to find out. Or you know, uh, will help you. This is me again. I won't talk about me except for I've been in AppSec forever with Dan and others, and uh, and and really help CISOs and CSOs work with uh, application security programs to build them. Uh, and so part of this idea about this survey came out of that. That we noticed that there was these champion programs everywhere. You know, I think the one of the first ones was. Uh, what Brad Arkin did way back at Adobe with the ninjas. And so we started to see these things come up in different world ways. That was the thing that we that was the genesis of this idea. We'd seen them. they have been a thing. As a consultant, you get to see lots of client environments. And we saw that these things were everywhere, but nobody had really you know, done any quantitative analysis of it. So that was the thought here. So given the limitation of time, I'm going to try to blast through this. I won't do any justice to it uh, numbers wise, but again, I am uh, publishing the numbers uh, this next month, which is really just, I guess, a week from now now. So we're coming, that's coming up. I'll talk about the, I'll give you a, a sense of what we did to, for the survey itself, the questions, specific questions, the results, and then allow, allow some time to formulate questions in the Slack. So because the way the format is, it won't be interactive, it'll be interactive on Slack. I'll try to take the time that I have uh, to go through this in, in a meaningful way. But the, for the starting point for this was we did what's called a structured research approach. And what does that mean? It means that we knew that there were certain questions that lent themselves to some form of quantitative analysis, you know, numbers. And there's other ones that we wanted to ask questions and have follow-up questions and be able to kind of uh, do a little bit, uh, you know, more interactive research, uh, but at least have data in a somewhat structured way where we can make some sense out of it. So it's not just a narrative. So it looked less like a, a survey monkey uh, form, and it looked a little bit more like a focus group is what we started to say. And of course, I had to go and ask people for time during the first few months of a pandemic where everyone had an excuse not to do this. So this is all done via Zoom. And it uh, ended up being, you know, like I said, a, a, an exercise, a labor of love, but also an exercise of learning a bunch about uh, surveys. Uh, my background is a, I'm a political science as an undergraduate, an MBA type. So I'm used to, uh, you know, doing quantitative research around surveys. It's a little bit of background. I'm an AppSec guy. So our goal was to capture best practices or probably better said emerging practices. What are the commonalities across programs? 
what were the kind of things that jumped out? And again, we started with some hypotheses um, and, and based upon anecdote. And, and the joke is, if you have two anecdotes, you have data, you know? So we kind of came from that and had fairly modest expectations going in. We also wanted to identify some of the common challenges and attributes, you know, around uh, these programs, uh, including the environments. So like, you know, given this transition from a very much on-prem and kind of web app world to a, a much more different application world, what were, what were, what were, what were the developers practicing or building and what were the app site people uh, trying to measure? So what we did is we worked with uh, a series of companies and I had to, you know, target the folks. So anybody that was a program owner, self-identified as an AppSec person, you know, or a security architect that did application security. Uh, I didn't really interview, uh, you know, trainers per se, or network folks or CISOs. It was people that were, you know, OWASPs, SMEs, OWASP folks, uh, folks that knew and had worked with or started application security champions programs within their organization. So a fairly narrow universe. And we focused on that group. And what I ended up doing is I, you know, first of all, I had to sell them on participation. And believe it or not, in this day and age, about a third of the companies we talked to said, look, I'm either precluded from doing it. My boss doesn't support it. Don't care. We're in a pandemic, can't share information. So, I mean, this was a, a, the recruitment of people to participate and the level of effort was actually quite uh, ambitious. We ended up doing two or three interviews, one to sell them on the idea, secondly, to gather data validate data. And the value that for them to participate was uh, comparative data uh, that we could say, well, look, this is where what you responded to, and this is where everybody else came in. So there was a little bit of that. Think of SAM or BSAM as examples, but just in this narrow scope of, of uh, champions. And the, uh, the result is this report and the data uh, that's coming out next month. So again, labor of love, it took uh, the better part of, well, now over a year, uh, given the embargo and all that in the pandemic, but it's pretty cool stuff. And I think will also be a, a launching off point for further analysis and hopefully inspire others. I'd say the broadest goal of this was to up the art of application security, was to provide people in the field uh, with, with more ammo to push their initiatives, to push AppSec programs to give a little bit more meat to the bones. So that was really it. So that we could look back and say, this went from a, a thing that was kind of just happened organically in the field to a more organized and uh, structured thing. Interesting enough, if you talk to the analysts of the world, the Gartners, the force of the, of the world, they don't, they don't really focus on this. They focus on technology stuff, technology solutions. As far as process, they do. You bring up AppSec champions and other process stuff. They just kind of don't care. Uh, for, so the whole story behind that. But the net of it is, we again saw this everywhere. So we want to bring this up as a and, and, and all the AppSec folks that we work with, all the good programs had one. So that's the other thing. Virtually every good program that we work with in the field had a champions program. So we knew there's something there. So. But looking for the candidates ended up being a big effort. I took uh, you know full time AppSec staff. Uh, and we, we ended up with 26 companies. It was interesting because uh, we ended up, I started, I think I started with 60 plus, and there was probably about 10 of them who were going through the process and interviewing them and starting to kind of, uh, for better, for lack of a better term, qualify them. And we realized that really what they had was an AppSec training program, a developer training program. So really what this, what we were talking about here specifically is an AppSec Champions program. I, I think if you're an OWASP person, you understand what this is, but for the lay people, the definition is the use of, a, of an AppSec team that has very little managerial control, uh, influencing and, and driving the AppSec uh, practices and behaviors to a much larger development team that they have very little span of control over. So the concept of lack of managerial control, uh, influence, uh, and then the sheer numbers. What we knew from anecdote was, you know, most AppSec programs had a few folks, the bigger ones have lots of folks, but there was always this number mismatch. So you'd have five people and a hundred or a thousand developers. So that was, that was the starting point. So we looked, we ended up having and working with 26 companies and, and back and forth and back and forth. They represent some of the best programs in some of the better companies. So right off the bat, there's sample bias, there's, you know, I'll fully acknowledge that. 
But what we did want to do is we didn't work, want to work with companies that had no program, you know, because they put big zeros or, you know, that they, they weren't really building software. They were licensing it from the Jack Henry's of the, you know, or the Fiserv's of the world. It was really people that built software and, you know, had, had were big enough where they had an AppSec person, you know, or people, you know, so that was kind of a qualifying event. As it turned out, more than 50% of the companies had more than 10,000 folks in them. So these were, this is largely the domain of the larger companies. The smaller companies were probably more like the FinTech or the SaaS platform folks. It's still, they made it from a headcount standpoint, been a thousand or 2000, but they, you know, they were a SaaS banking platform. So they had a lot of focus on uh, that particular, you know, they had a focus on AppSet. So, uh, but, but, but big enterprises, not an SMB or small medium-sized business play, uh, you know, and, and so that was that was the the, the the attributes of the companies was important. So the questions themselves, and I had, I think at one point about 20 plus questions, uh, and, I, and some of which, uh, most of them followed the hypothesis. Some of them uh, were interesting, others ones were uninteresting. I'll, I'll talk to the results. But the first thing I wanted to uh, determine what, you know, a little bit of organizational background, because I could infer certain things about the attributes of the program based on the background and then some trade-offs uh, around sophistication and around, uh, you know, practices. So the first thing I looked at is I just asked basic questions. You know, how many devs do you have? How many AppSec, full-time AppSec people do you have, regardless if they're FTEs, like, uh, you know, contractors? I don't care. I just want to know how many that are functioning in that role. And there's some discretion there of, of collection. And we kind of went back and forth on that. And then kind of how many AppSec champions, you know, and, and the, the primary inputs for that were ended up being uninteresting, but the derivation and the results from uh, comparing those became more interesting. I'll talk about that. The maturity as self-identified along a, a broad CMMI inspired scale, you know, kind of the environments versus, you know, a cloud, how many of them had pipelines, you know, some of this stuff was to to grab, gather information broadly, and then from there look at trend lines, see if any uh, key findings came out. And, and as luck would have it, some did. Uh, how long did it take these AppSec managers or these security managers to build the programs, and how long had they been in place? What were the attributes of the program? What kind of mandate did they have? Did they have training? How formalized was it? Did they have incentives? How did they recruit uh, champions? All that stuff was part of the questions that came out in the survey. And then two key questions in the end is, you know, did they, you know, kind of a yes, no, did they feel that they were achieving results? And if so, how did they measure ROI? Just two questions. Again, we had a bunch of other draft questions. We threw out some, and as a matter of fact, there's some other ones that we just flat out didn't use for um, feedback. So right off the bat, I asked, you know, how would you care, self-identify, how would you characterize your AppSec ch uh, champion program? Uh, based on a broad scale. And I put some attributes around this that I enumerate in the report, but uh, the vast majority were maturing, between maturing and mature. Um, there were a few that were just getting started that said they were emerging. Um, there were a couple that were up at the improving area, no, no optimizing. Uh, so that was an interesting starting point is, uh, you know, there and, and the numbers reflect that, that they said, hey, you know, we recognize we're, we're moving along uh, and there was a lot of back and forth dialogue about mature versus maturing and the attributes of that. So there's some discretion here, but majority of them felt that they had some level of program in place and were moving uh, and improving uh, the program itself. So that's the starting point for analysis. Uh, and in the report itself, I kind of break out a little bit of the different attributes of that. So here's one of the things that came out uh, that is initially uninteresting, but then the, the derivation uh, secondary analysis was interesting. First of all, you know, how many developers do you have? Like on average, 1,600, a number that doesn't mean a whole lot because samples all over the place. How many app six staff per, uh, you know, uh, that were focused? Average is 13. And then how many champions, you know, they're all over the place. Uh, the more mature ones had more, as you might imagine. And, and I didn't ask one question I wish I had at the time, which was the coverage between AppSec champions and teams. Like what percentage of teams had a, a champion? I was like halfway into it. And then I wish I'd asked that. But the key finding was the ratio between AppSec staff and development staff was one to 50 to one to 100 for the mature programs. 
Uh, they, all along that uh, spectrum were the mature to maturing programs were somewhere between one to 50 ratio of AppSec people, not the champions, but the actual AppSec staff to developers. And particularly as it related to the financial and fintech companies, right down the middle, uh, one to 50 to one, 100. I come, came to find out after the fact uh, that some of these, that reflects numbers that also are parallel to what uh, the folks doing BSIM have come up with too, at least in a couple of instances, which I think is cool. So that that is a, um, a, a key finding that kind of jumped out. The average numbers don't mean as much. Um, I looked at other things to infer in sophistication around tool and pipeline usage. Uh, all this stuff is, is enumerated in the report, but in a long story made short is the vast, you know, the majority of them were using pipelines or trending to use pipelines. Uh, almost all of them said we're going down that path. You know, very few were doing old school dev, as, as you might imagine. Um, and what percent were hosted in the cloud? 30% uh, said over 90% were. And the interesting thing on both, the, 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 the lines were a little bit blurred there, distorted by the fact that uh, I had two or three of the very largest uh, uh, financial services and banks that reported they're all on-prem, uh, which is uh, for the big banks, a thing absent of at least one big bank who is, uh, you know, primarily in, in AWS. A lot of them still are on prem, so that's interesting. Um, so here's one that jumped out as a big one. Um, so I asked a question about how many people, you know, what, how many of y'all had SaaS or DAS or SCA or what, you know, and what I found out is almost all of the mature and virtually all the maturing ones had all three SaaS, DAS, and software composition analysis in place which there's, you know, I heard Chris Weisselfel's speech, you know, talk about at least two. I also heard Etan's uh, presentation from um, HCL. So there's a common theme here, you know, multiple tools, uh, correlation. And I think Gardner also says at least use two tools. Well, guess what? Uh, the most mature ones use all three of those uh, as part of their testing program. And I thought that was a, a cool thing that I didn't anticipate. Uh, how long did it take to build program the program itself? About uh, about twenty percent of a year, um, and so so a year to a little bit over a year. Some of them were in progress at the point. Now, the one interesting thing that um, came out from this that I didn't anticipate is a multiple resets. We had uh, uh, clients that had come back and said, "Hey, uh, you know, we we lost a key personnel or a leadership change." And as a result, we have a complete, uh, you know, like we're starting over. So these numbers are kind of muddled, but think at least a year to a uh, year plus to get these up and running. Now, the other interesting thing is I asked how long they had been in place. And, you know, a lot, there are some of the big financial ones have been in place for over four years. That 27% not, not didn't know what had happened is there's so much turnover in AppSec that I had about a third of the respondents say that they didn't know, they had no idea, or we, we had to find out. So they had started before they had arrived and were in place already. So one of the secondary findings from this is that like these things need leadership, um, you know, focus and care and feeding or else, you know, key person leaves or direction changes and they, um, and they can go away. Uh, here is another thing about organizational background that I found out is the most AppSec programs did not have a strong mandate from, you know, the opposite of the trusted computing initiative from Bill Gates in 2002. As a matter of fact, two thirds either had no mandate or CISO only. And I, and, and for the purposes of this presentation, like, of this report is like, if you have the CISO only that, of course you do. You know, I didn't have a single respondent that said they had the CFO, COO, or CEO. The best I had was like CTO or DevLib. So that's an important thing is like these, these things are happening organically as we suspected, um, lacking the trusted computing initiative leadership, the, the top down Bill Gates approach. Uh, so here's some interesting ones and it's just the time I'm gonna blast through them. Did you have defined roles and standards? 62% uh, said, yes, that's a, it's a relatively no, low number um, that a lot of the programs use volunteered, but not as many as I thought. There's a, a healthy combination of volunteered and voluntold, which the assumption here is you're trying to get people that are evangelical, you know, on the dev teams. Uh, you, you may want to have people that are really already bought in. So I do think, I didn't enumerate this in the report, but the, the real ones that were successful anecdotally were ones that had volunteered, you know, and how do you recruit volunteers? There's a whole discussion track there. 
Um, the last two results surprised me. They did not have formal training programs. The majority didn't, and they didn't have rewards. So one of the secondary re recommendations from this is that you should, when you're starting these programs, have a, a, a formalized training and formalized reward program to scale. Uh, that, that uh, And rewards don't have to be spending a lot of money. It could be you know, the rewards like recognition uh, amongst one's peers. That's, that's important too. So the last a couple of things, two or three things that we came up with is, you know, the back and forth. How do you, how frequently do you communicate? And, um, you know, it's a constantly. Well, that, that what happened is we found out, of course, Slack teams, like constantly, monthly. But what, the, the, what we also found out that was less obvious is uh, folks identify this. This first came out in the secondary questions was like, yeah, we communicate for, all the time on Slack. But there's still a role for formalized like a, a communications, either a once a month town hall or a once a month newsletter where we recognize people. So that that's back and forth. That's great that we have Slack out there, but that doesn't constitute the only communication mechanism. And a formalized mechanism augmenting that is is probably pretty good. And of course, everybody, you know, 64 percent use Slack and Teams. There's probably two or three. I, that number that probably is underrepresented there. Uh, there's probably two or three that said they were doing the starting point of gamification comparison amongst teams. Um, you know, looking at uh, some of the training platforms like Secure Code Warrior, they do more of the gamification. That really didn't come up this much. I was surprised it didn't come up more in in the survey itself. So, um, okay, so I'm gonna uh, two things. Uh, you know, uh, two ROA questions I ask: Are you achieving your desired outcome? You know, like broadly, yes or no. So, you know, not, not all of them did, you know, and, and I think there was, this bore a lot of follow-up conversations, and a lot of head scratching, but I mean, these things just started organically in certain instances and they started doing it and there wasn't a whole lot of forethought in, in, in many instances of what the outcome looked like. And the same thing is too, on the numbers side, we've been able to quantify success. The majority said no or partly in the case of certain service providers, they said, well, we kind of have in the form of like, you know, bug, you know, uh, bug, bug, uh, bug reports or mean time to fix numbers. But really, we have never asked our clients, you know, or we haven't asked the business units themselves. So that, that is an interesting observation. I assumed that there would be more of that and there wasn't. So again, I've got like five minutes. So I, wanna, I don't want to blow through the, the key findings and some recommendations. First of all, there was a strong belief in these programs, regardless of the numbers. I mean, period. There's an evangelical component to this, as you know, as AppSec is. I mean, we are we we are still preaching to the the vast unwashed masses in certain instances, or we're trying to you know convince the developers to do something. So that's true. The ROI that we got was was you know the ROI reports were were great, but not as much as we had. the anecdotes though were fantastic. As a matter of fact, we got many of them that will be were in the report where, you know, they said, no, we didn't capture those numbers. We don't have anything formalized, but wow, when, you know, the, the, this guy said this in front of the business unit, uh, you know, that, that just took off. So there's a, there was a lot of anecdote that came out and that's why the report and the uh, survey was, was ended up being, you know, very valuable is that the numbers themselves were interesting, but some of the anecdotes and some of the war stories were great too. Uh, the majority of programs had a weak managerial a mandate as we anticipated, and that there were certain correlations that do exist between, you know, those, those numbers between Dev and AppSec staff and the, the, the SAS, DAS, and SCA and maturity. I thought those were things that jumped out that were pretty interesting. Um, again, the, the, the in-depth uh, survey is in, going to be in the report, but here's the relevance to you, and this is for from an Intel push is like, like as a manager, you have to not do one for one work. Uh, you have to do all these other things uh, and make, oh, let me go back um, and, and make and, and, and influence others and influence group. This is absolutely the case with AppSec champions. Again, a handful of uh, AppSec people trying to influence thousands of developers. Um, comparative data around surveys is important in general, comparing from your peers using uh, like FSI SAC or SAM or BSIM or whatever, anything that you can do to compare is important. Uh, but in order to gain that managerial leverage, you do need to capture and formalize some of these, the things around training and around ROI numbers. You can't do word of mouth or 
you know, you just can't do the standard way that, you know, uh, tribal knowledge, you actually have to have things laid out, uh, training materials in order to scale. So in order to get scale leverage, you have to do that. And finally, um, you know, we'll know when we're successful when, when the developers themselves start to view uh, security or, or whatever you want to call it, resiliency as a, as a component of code quality, where there's no longer this, this confrontational deal. They've just essentially like UI, UX or other aspects and facets of development. It's just a concept of quality that they pull in and we're coaching and validating and doing whatever. We're not central to that. So uh, that is the end of the Prezo. I think I hit it right close to the end of the hour. Um, that's my uh, Twitter handle. Uh, and if you're interested in the report, the initial report, I'm, I'm doing the final uh, edits. It'll be out in October. And not, when I say October, I don't mean like four days from now or next week. I mean, like, like probably October, October. Uh, but I'm interested. The other thing is if you're interested in, in this topic, uh, I've got a lot of feedback about building a community of interest around this and about people that are uh, fired up about AppSec Champions. So uh, please reach out on LinkedIn, on Twitter, or on uh, join the Slack afterwards. So with that, I'll hand it all back over to Ann.